Okay, so uh, you've brought us a case, and it's a real head scratcher. Mm. I mean, we're talking a decade long disappearance. We've got psychic predictions swirling around, and then there's this friendship right in the middle of it all that went very, very wrong. So basically, we're diving into the story of Chris Daigle vanished, just like that. Yeah, and it's one of those stories that really gets to you because it shows how quickly things can go from ordinary to, well, a complete mystery. You've got two best friends, grew up together, did everything together, and then poof, one of them disappears. Like seriously, it's like something you'd hear on a true crime podcast, you know? <laughs> Chris Daigle and Ricky Mendoza, these guys were practically joined at the hip back in Missouri City, Texas. Right, like two peas in a pod. Yeah. Exactly. Little League, high school baseball stars, you name it, they were side by side. But then... November 7th, 2002 comes along and Chris just vanishes, gone. And naturally, everyone's looking at the last person who saw Chris Ricky Mendoza. Of course. So what's the story? What happened? Well, the police show up at Ricky's door wanting answers. And Ricky says he dropped Chris off at the mall that afternoon. No big deal, right? Except that's the last anyone ever sees of Chris. So it's dead end from the get-go, pretty much. Pretty much. Tips came in, they followed every lead, but nothing panned out. It was like Chris had just disappeared off the face of the earth. And this goes on for years, right? right. I mean, years with no sign up. Years. And you have to remember, Chris had a history of, you know, disappearing for a few days here and there. Sometimes he'd dabble in drugs. His grandmother even confirmed that much. So naturally, everyone's thinking... Maybe this is just Chris doing his thing, laying low for a while. Right. Because of his past, it's like a pattern repeating itself. Yeah. So the investigators, they're thinking maybe he's just gone off the grid, chosen to disappear. Exactly. And that's the thing about these cases. The past has a way of clouding the present. Investigators have to consider every angle, even if it means looking back at old habits. So it's like trying to solve a puzzle, but some of the pieces just keep leading you in circles. Exactly. You've got a missing person, a best friend with a story that might be full of holes and years of unanswered questions. It's enough to drive anyone crazy. So where do you even begin to unravel something like that? Where do you even start? Well, that's where things take a turn. See, with the official investigation going nowhere, Chris's family, driven by his mother's love, of course they decide to try something different. They consult a psychic. A psychic. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, you have to admit, in these situations, it's kind of hard not to think about the what ifs. Like, what if there's something more to it than meets the eye? Right. It makes you think about all those stories. But, you know, more than anything, it shows how much we crave answers, especially when we feel like we've hit a wall. For sure. So let's talk about the psychic. What did she say? Did she give any specific details about... Chris's disappearance? Oh, she did. And this is where it gets really interesting. It wasn't just some vague feeling she had, you know. This psychic, she lays it out clear as day. She says there were three boys. They were wearing hats. They were on a dirt road surrounded by trees. And then she claims an argument broke out and Chris was shot in the back of the head with shotgun. Hold on. That's like incredibly specific. It's almost like she was there or something. Did any of it turn out to be true? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? On the one hand, we have to remember that there's no real scientific evidence to back up these psychic predictions, right? Yeah, it's not exactly something you can take to court. Exactly. But then again, you've got a family desperate for answers, clinging to any shred of hope. And these predictions, they offered a glimmer of that, regardless of whether they were true or not. So it's like a double-edged sword almost. I mean, on the one hand, it might be giving false hope, but on the other hand, any kind of hope is better than none when you're in that situation, right? Absolutely. Especially for Chris's mom, Tracy. Imagine being in her shoes, clinging on to every word, hoping against hope that maybe, just maybe, this psychic could lead her to her son. It's like a lifeline, even if it's a long shot. <laughs> so what happened next? How did Tracy respond to all of this? Well, Tracy, bless her heart, she took those predictions and turned them into fuel. She got a job, but not just any job. She started working at a bar. A bar. What good would that do? Well, it was a local spot, the kind of place Chris and his friends used to hang out at. Ah, uh, so she's going undercover yes, in a sir. way, hoping to catch wind of anything that might lead her to Chris. Exactly. And it really goes to show the lengths she was willing to go to for her son. Remember, this is seven years after his disappearance, and she's still searching, still hoping. So Tracy's working at this bar hoping to catch a break in the case. Did anything ever come from it? It seems kind of far-fetched. Well, you never know what little thing might break a case open. So get this, seven years after Chris vanishes, a guy named Tyler Hall walks into that very same bar where Tracy's working. Seven years. That's a long time to hold on to hope. What happened? 
Does this Tyler guy, did he know something? Turns out, Tyler, he knew Ricky. And not just Ricky, he also knew Ricky's girlfriend at the time, a woman named Megan Venable. Okay, so what's the connection? How do they tie into everything? Well, according to Tyler, Megan had told him that Ricky had this, well, intense jealousy towards Chris. Apparently, it was mostly about Megan, actually. Wait, so there's a love triangle going on here. Yeah, it's getting complicated, right? But it gets worse. <sighs> See, Tyler also claimed that Megan said Ricky had bragged about killing Chris. He bragged about it to his girlfriend. Well, yeah, Damn. to his girlfriend. Of course, at the time, Tyler just thought Ricky was talking big, you know, drunk and trying to sound tough. Right, like you do when you've had a few too many. Exactly. But now, years later, with Chris still missing, those words take on a whole new meaning. It's chilling when you think about it. So did the police, did they ever look into Tyler's story? They did. But think about it. It's just hearsay, right? A story passed from one person to another. They brought Ricky in, questioned him, but he stuck to his story, said he didn't do it. And without any hard evidence, they couldn't hold him. Man, it's just heartbreaking for Chris's family. So close to the truth, but still so far away. It really is. But sometimes the truth has a funny way of coming out, no matter how hard people try to hide it. And in this case, it took another year, but someone finally broke the silence. Really? Who was it? It was Chris's half-brother, Travis Reznicek. He ran into a guy named Jose Lopez. Okay, and what did Jose know? Was he involved somehow? Well, Jose claimed that he'd heard Ricky confess, too. Apparently, Ricky had just come right out and said it, bragged about it, in front of Jose. Wow, so this isn't just a one-time slip-up. Right. It seems like Ricky couldn't keep his mouth shut. Right. It makes you wonder, why would he do that? Was he feeling guilty? Or was it something else? We may never know for sure. Yeah, the human mind is a strange thing. So the police, they had these two guys saying, Ricky confessed, what do they do next? Well, now they had enough to really start putting the pressure on the people who were with Ricky the night Chris disappeared. They focused on Ricky's cousin, Daniel Rodriguez, and a friend of his, Joshua Fretz. These were teenagers at the time, right? Yeah. They must have been terrified. You can imagine. Young guys caught up in something like that with someone older, someone they probably looked up to, telling them to keep quiet. It's a recipe for disaster. So what happened? Did they finally talk? It was Joshua Fretz who cracked. He told the police that Ricky had lured Chris, Daniel, and himself out to this field, said they were going mushroom hunting. Sounds innocent enough. What happened out there? Well, according to Fretz, Ricky just out of nowhere pulled out a shotgun and shot Chris in the back of the head. Just like that. Killed him instantly. Oh, my God. That's awful. And to make matters worse, Ricky threatened both Fretz and Rodriguez, swore them to secrecy. Wow. It's no wonder they kept quiet for so long. They were just kids. And that's the tragedy of it all. Because of their fear, Ricky was able to get away with murder for almost a decade. But Fretz, he agreed to lead the police to where they'd buried Chris. So after all those years, Chris's family finally got some answers. They did. But it's a bittersweet victory, isn't it? It makes you wonder about the nature of jealousy, the power of rage, how quickly things can spiral out of control. And it also shows how the truth sometimes has a way of working its way out, even after all those years. It's a story that stays with you. It does. And, you know, it makes you think, how well do we really know to people around us? What secrets are they hiding? It's a chilling thought. And that's a wrap on another Deep Dive, folks. Until next time, remember, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction.